So what do the cross and the resurrection of Jesus have to do with games and play? Do they have anything to do with games and play? These are the questions that a man named Jürgen Moltmann wrestled with over 50 years ago in a fascinating book titled Theology of Play. And they're the questions we're considering today on part three of our discussion of Jürgen Moltmann's Theology of Play. This episode of Board Game Faith, the bi-weekly show exploring the intersection of religion, spirituality, and board games. Hello, Hello, everybody. Daniel. Hello. Hello. Hi, Kevin. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm doing fine. Thank you. It's good to see you. It's good to hear your voice. It's good to welcome to the podcast all of our, our listeners. If you're listening to the podcast or viewers, if you're watching us on, on YouTube, thank you so much for joining us. We're glad to have you here. My, my name is Daniel. Faithful. The Board Game Faithful. The Board Game Faithful, as we yes. like to, to call our our uh, our fam <laughs> which is the word i like to call family right it's it's a hip new phrase the fam la familia la familia is the fam so yes so my name is daniel hilty my name's kevin taylor and and we welcome all of you board game faithful fam it's uh That's it's right great to have you here whether this is the First time you're listening to us, or whether you've listened to us before, welcome. Um, That's right. This is uh, the show where we take a look at, at matters of religion and spirituality and games and play, and we're so grateful to have you along for the ride. So, so Kevin, what's, yeah. um, what's happening in, in your world? Well, uh, Halloween is tomorrow. Um, Halloween is tomorrow. And it, that's, that's become kind of an international holiday i think mostly due to american culture <clears throat> like it's yeah. being celebrated in lots of places and of course that's that's consumerism and capitalism because yeah. you can make some money selling candy and costumes um so that's going to probably grow in lots of countries but yeah that's tomorrow i think it's supposed to rain in the morning mm. is halloween and a big thing cool in your house tomorrow night sir is Halloween a big thing in your household? I talked over you. You know, Sorry. our kids are older now. They're teenagers. There might be some wandering around the neighborhood, but it's really kind of a little kid thing to go around for candy. And the sad mm -hmm. bit is so many, I don't know, our culture is so fo focused on holidays now. So many little kids have been trick-or-treating like six times already because they do it in the school and they do it, you know, and, and, and the, the, the after school, everyone's like, let's go trick-or-treating. And it's a week before. Yeah. Yeah, kind of like yeah. Thanksgiving, it's... you can end up with three Thanksgiving meals if you're not careful. That's true. That is yeah. true. No, you're right. Our, uh, Kristen and I bought, f I think, I think around 400 pieces of candy uh, for our our Halloween season, and we went to our church's kind of Halloween event. Um, like a lot of churches do something trunk or treat. I think it's called mm -hmm. um, a uh, a few nights ago, and we gave. We ended up giving out all of our all of our Halloween candies. Now we got to go out and get oh, some more. Yeah, you're right. There are multiple trick or treating opportunities. Um, the best is if your kids are trick or treating and they have some of those. What you do is you recycle the candy because they generally can't eat it all anyway. So there's just a candy tax that half their candy then gets reused Halloween cool. night, assuming they they've already trick or treated. <coughs> So that's a good yeah. idea. Does this count for candy you've taken out of the wrapper as well? Can you like put it back in the it wrapper? Does. Or, it does. Yeah. Let's say you didn't like it. <laughs> yeah. Um, you can wrap it back up or not. You can just sort of make a massive congealed spittle, spit, spittle can, spit, spit yeah, tune. Yeah. I don't see anything wrong candy. with that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you've got to, they say we're too clean these days. That's why we have allergies. Um, it we need it a introduces more. a little, um, <laughs> just a little seed of building up the immune system for the next person. Um, it's sort of a vaccine through your mouth. <clears throat> a vaccine through your mouth. I and like that's that. It's called disease. <laughs> it's called disease. <laughs> also, your eye holes. Yeah. I, I that's the worst. Anything. They're like, don't touch your eyes. And you're like, oh, my God, I really want to touch my eyes. Oh, right my now. eyes are so itchy. Yeah, They're so yeah. itchy because you're so <laughs> 
I don't judge my eyes right now. I'm just talking about it. I know. Yeah. 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 So funny, the power of suggestion. Yeah. Well, we have a special guest today, Daniel. This special guest isn't even a person, but instead self identifies as a book. Yeah. Well, that's right. Because it's, it's the theology of play, the book. Theology of play, the book. Welcome, theology of play, the book. <laughs> We're glad to have we'll you have here. To. Now, the uh, theology of play, the book, does not have a um, mouth or breath apparatus, so it can't speak. So we'll have to speak for it. I think. I think we should imagine what it what it would say. I think, like right now, <laughs> we would you know say, that... <laughs> "I'm happy to be here." That's right. Did you know okay. that a book and an iron lung is the exact same conversation? <laughs> really. <laughs> Fascinating. Fascinating. I know. Yeah. Neither can that's, really speak. Years of research have yielded that years kind of research of, there. That's yeah, great. Yes. And who 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 is the author of this? Jurgen um, Moltmann, still alive. Yeah. Quite elderly at this point. Born in nineteen twenty six. Wow. He was a German reformed theologian. So reform meaning Presbyterian is what we would kind of call it here in the US, but Reformed tradition of the Protestant stream of Christianity, right? There in Germany, mm-hmm, and he mm-hmm. was a professor emeritus, a retired professor of systematic theology at the University University of Tübingen. Tübingen, Tübingen, you say it. Tübingen, Tü- I think. Tübingen, I think I, the German's I'm, better than I'm mine. I'm sure my pronunciation isn't perfect either. Or, or... I, I, I just try to sing those use. Yeah, the little, the umlauts. Yeah, the uh, umlauts. Cobra, Cobra strike. Yeah, I like Cobra I like strike. Tubingen, Tubingen. Known and he is known for many books in the religious and theological world, and so we're focusing on this particular one. And he served, uh, which is a theology of play, which had a different title in German, that um, that will reference. I'll, I'll I'll grab that later because uh, I don't have it right in front of me. But uh, yeah, he was a pastor and a professor, was a POW, because he was fighting for Nazi Germany as a young German boy recruited into the, into the war. But he surrendered and abandoned his, uh, the German army and became a POW and then became a Christian. So quite a, quite a dramatic story. What a journey. And thank you, Kevin, yeah, for that, that introduction to him. And um, if this is your first time listening to us um we want you to know this is it's a uh, this book is it's not in print anymore and it's one of the but it's also one of the few books out there specifically about what the subject of this podcast is uh, religion That's and right. games religion and play and so we've been slowly going through it taking about 10 pages at a time um so this is part three mm-hmm. um if you want to hear the first two parts you can look back on our previous episodes, but this time we're considering pages 25 through 36, I believe, if that's right. Right. We are saying too, Kevin. Yeah. 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 So it is out of print. You might get lucky and find a used copy on Amazon or eBay or a local library, university library may have a copy on the shelf, but it is unfortunately difficult to find. I wish it was out of print and then we could just share it, but it is, uh, or I'm sorry, out of copyright. I meant to say. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah. You know, we were doing Charles Dickens' Great Expectations, no problem. Copyrights wide open on that one. We should do the theology of play of Great Expectations. I've never read it. I know vaguely, or have I? No, I don't. I don't. I don't know. I read it a long time ago, and the only th- only thing I remember is Mrs. Haversham, who is this uh-huh. kind of like spooky woman who's never left her house for like... 50 years and there's like a, and like there are all these drapes and dusty stuff and and um and and she and she can't and and like anyway that's that i remember mrs mrs haversham she sounds to me like she i, I don't know why she didn't leave her house i forget maybe she was playing board games all that time but anyway that was the <laughs> she's playing chess by mail and had to wait for chess the by mail to come in the it. mail yeah didn't want to yeah. miss the mailman the yeah. postman <laughs> Who only rang once, and so sometimes she missed him. She missed him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or so. so, so this uh, this section we were talking before we started recording. I think we both find kind of one of the more engaging sections we've read so far. It's really interesting. He he begins with um, 
just just cutting very directly to um, the the some of the core matters of the the Christian faith. And we should say also, if this is your first time listening, um, both Kevin and I are Christian pastors, Methodist pastors, but we try to be a, an ecumenical show. We we have had guests before from various traditions, uh, Muslim, Jewish, Buddhist, atheist. Um, but in this particular episode, we're talking about a Christian theologian. So we'll be kind of living, especially in that world. And and he cuts in this section to, to kind of this the heart of much of the heart of Christian theology and talking about the, the cross and the resurrection of Jesus, right? Um, as part of this discussion of play in theology. Right. Um, right. So, yeah. And, and the, the looming question for him is there's so many problems in the world, uh, terrible disease and wars and famines and global epidemics what's the place of games and play jesus didn't tell us to play games and and he so what's the basis for christians engaging in play i right. think is the looming right. question right G given given global and local concerns and problems and i think maybe for him and correct me if you disagree kevin but i think maybe for him the central christian metaphor for all those things that make us feel like we shouldn't play suffering, war, poverty, hunger, injustice, the, the, the central symbol for that in our Christian vocabulary is the cross, you know? And so, so how right. can we play in the face of the suffering of the world? How can we play in, in the face of the cross? You know? Yeah. Suffering um, God. So should, yeah, are yeah. we supposed to suffer too? Or, or shouldn't we take things more seriously because God or Jesus died for us? So, um, yeah. 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 And it feels like he starts to explore that question in terms of how can we play in the face of the cross by exploring kind of what the cross means and what did it mean mm -hmm. that Jesus died? And, um, and he kind of explores some, some interesting approaches to understanding the cross that I don't think we necessarily readily hear in our, in our society today. It's out there, but not necessarily things we hear a lot. Um, so yeah, is that I mean, is that something mm -hmm. you like to would you like would you like to delve into a little bit that Kevin or would you like me to in terms of I think Daniel just passed me off. the ball. So I'm no, I'm to, happy to <laughs> I'm I'm it's, it's Are you using a sports metaphor? Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what I was trying to That's do. Great. I was like, is it I, first I used, down and four? How did, how did I used they say my hockey football? stick to pass you the ball. <laughs> I did. And I think there's a flag. I'm trying to shoot towards a little flag on the hill. The, and the flag's on the, the side of the basket. On the side um, of the basket. If I can get in there right. and, and one, I get a hole. In, I get a birdie to take that's, home with me. A little bird. That's <laughs> exactly right. That's exactly right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. So, a very simple way Christians often talk about the cross, unfortunately, is is that people are sinners and then Jesus died to pay the price of that or to overcome the sin or pay the guilt of the sin and you should be grateful and and that's kind of is that fair like this this gets packaged as the four spiritual laws or or uh, just a very simple message about who is Jesus what did he do right and right and Moltmann's saying hey Moltmann is throwing a flag on that play or that Ooh, exposition by saying words. Well, I know, and I'm full of them. I'm going to be an ESPN commentator soon. So Moltmann says, now hang on, there's a lot more to it than what, than just what you've outlined because Jesus was it, it, as God incarnated. That tells us something. God who created the world has also taken on uh, the human both him and that Jesus taught and did things and Jesus was resurrected from the dead. So this means that it's not just about doom and gloom and death and penalty, but it's about something else as well, especially in the idea that Jesus resurrection is sort of a new creation mm -hmm. and is, mm -hmm. is a, a return to Eden in some ways and also a amplification of Eden. So it's, mm, it's, mm, mm -hmm. um, yeah. What would you add to that? Daniel? No, I love that. Yeah. That's, that's well said. And you're always so good at, at, uh, 
lifting up those themes that kind of um, prefigure and point to kind of Eden and paradise oh, and you. utopia. And I, um, yeah, I, I, no, I agree. And I, I find, I guess one theological term for this might be the atonement, right? That the, the um, and, but it's, it's, you know, it's basically our attempts to answer the question, why did Jesus die? Right. And, mm-hmm. um, and, and I don't know about you in your experience as a pastor, Kevin, but I, I find as a pastor that it's always, this is always a tricky thing to talk about because, because for a lot of people, it's, it's such a, a sacred subject, right? Such a precious mm-hmm. subject. And, and to offer different ways of talking about it can often be really challenging to folks or almost kind of upsetting to folks. And it's, it's, I, I've found it tricky, but it's this idea that, you know, when Jesus died, the early followers of Jesus found themselves in, in grief, right? That, that and, um, and the church in, in some ways kind of faced this grief, the early church faced this grief and they did what humans have always done, which is in the face of grief, in the face of what seems like um, irrational loss and lo- loss in some ways always kind of feels irrational. Um, they try to make sense of it, right? Like, why did this happen? Right. This doesn't, you know, this doesn't mm-hmm. make sense. And uh, which we often do in the face of grief. Why did this person die? Or why did this bad thing happen? And right. And I, th- and I, th- you know, I think one tradition that developed in response to that is exactly what you're saying. You know, that this, that, uh, you know, we're sinful people. And so Jesus had to die um, so that we could be forgiven. Right. And, and for a lot of people, that's a, you know, it's, I just recognize that's a very, you know, meaningful and important part of their faith. And, and I mean, yeah, and it's a true statement that is, that is a very Christian statement, but yeah, yeah. But what, but then, but then it's also, but there are some, there are some challenges or not some challenges, but there are some, there's some challenging implications of that. You know, if we kind of right. explore that, what does it say about God? You know, what does it say about us? What does it say about Jesus? Yeah. It's only and, really a partial truth. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. You know, um, like I, 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 we may or may not want to get into this and we can even go back and cut this out later on, Kevin, if you want to. Um, but, you know, it, I, I kind of frame it like this sort of, you know, it's kind of like if we said, you know, um, you're going to love my dad. When you meet my dad, he's going to be great. You're going to see that he's really a wonderful, loving dad. Now, by the way, when you meet him, he can't tolerate any sinfulness. And so, you know, since you're sinful, uh, he's going to kill me. Uh, when you meet him, just you know, as it, so that he doesn't kill you. But you're going to see how great he is then, you know, and you know, and it, it kind of feels like that. Well, is your dad yeah. really loving then? You know, this isn't right, anything right. we would ascribe to human beings, and so, um, so you know, so it kind of creates these challenges. And so, I, so, so I think when Moltmann kind of pushes a little bit is to say, Jesus' death on the cross, coupled with his resurrection, is the point, right? And and that it's it's mm-hmm. not. And that it's not simply kind of like a plan B that God had to come up with in response to our sinfulness. Um, that it, it, it reveals something inherent and integral to the nature of God, Jesus, cross and resurrection coupled together. That would be true regardless of whether we were sinful or not, in a way. Does that, does that vibe with your reading of it or, or with just... Yeah, what are no, your thoughts it does. On any of that? It does. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, it, it um, and I think this was a debate in the Middle Ages. Thomas Aquinas and theologians of of would Jesus have come and been incarnated without human sin or not? And it's yeah. very speculative. Um, but yes, it, it's more than simply a remedy for sin. It's more than simply a salve on a wound. It's actually a transformative moment. Mm, it, mm-hmm, it's a recreation, mm-hmm. so it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's it's like the act of creation being done in a different key, right? Is, right. is what he's trying to point to with the resurrection. Um, so, so his comment: God's love, he says, goes beyond his mercy and beyond man's misery. So that would be the sin notion. Mm-hmm, it reaches mm-hmm. beyond the mere restoration of the sick. To the healthy state of the new life. Mm, mm. So it's a, a great line there. Mm. So how would we put that in today's language? Like what what is 
in Moltmann's view, the point of Jesus. And I think when he talks about the point of Jesus, he means kind of his life and death and resurrection, kind of you know, all of that together. What, yeah, and, and I'm glad you said that. I think that's a key bit is he wants to think of Jesus in his full context. It's not just right. his death, but it it's is. It's not his, just the cross. Yeah, yeah. It's not which just we often cross. boil it's it down birth, to today. His life, his ministry, his teaching, and his resurrection. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, if we stick with the illness analogy, that health is not just getting over a virus. It's actually being in a state of mental and physical well-being. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you could be overweight and depressed and then get a terrible virus, you know, stomach bug, and then you get over it. But you're still larger state. You're now you're depressed. Now you got over an illness, but you're still in a state of dis, of unhealth mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because you're mentally and physically not as healthy as you could be. Health is more than just the absence of a particular illness. Yes, it's, yeah, yes. Health yeah, is more yeah. than the absence of disease. It's actually a flourishing. Mm, and mm, and mm. so this idea of of the resurrection is is more than just overcoming sin. It's about a human flourishing. Mm. That's that's how I would think of it. And and another bit to connect this to is is as you were hinting at earlier, uh, what does it say about God? I think he's wanting to connect the resurrection with God's creation. Both of them were not necessary. It's something God chooses to do. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it's not. It's not a random roll of the dice that God creates the world, nor is it something God had to do. And right. the cross and the resurrection were similarly intentional, but indicate that God can kind of be a God of play. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think Moman really <clears throat> kind of goes to great efforts to say, you know, in this in the section that, you know, he doesn't see the cross as playful, right? You know, the, the cross... In, right. He says, I, I think he said, the cross is not play, the Christ is not a game, but the resurrection is, right? It, the, cross, the resurrection is playful. What do you think he's trying to get at when he talks about that? Or I could ask myself that too. I'm asking you because I don't know. <laughs> oh, well, I, I'm guessing that there's some that might say, well, Christianity's focused on the cross and Good Friday and we shouldn't be playing games. In fact, the ga playing games is what the centurions were doing while Jesus died when they were casting lots for his clothing and stuff. Yeah. And Moltmann's like, yeah, you're right. That's not a that's not an appropriate response to the fact that Jesus died this terrible death as a criminal, and is rejected by by religious leaders and one of the great political jurists of the day, you know, the Roman Empire. Uh, that's not the basis for games. The basis for games is the joy of the resurrection. Mm -hmm. So he wants mm -hmm. to ground it something different because he agrees that that it, it you don't do you don't go to a Good Friday service at church and play bingo. That's just kind of weird. Right. Right. <laughs> that that would not jive. But no. Easter morning, sure. Yeah. In fact, he says I, I didn't look the footnote, but he makes the comment that it, traditionally Easter sermons used to begin with a joke. Isn't that great? Yeah. I had no idea that just, that was the case. Yeah, I don't know what he's pulling from, but I just picture some weird Puritan <laughs> preacher, and he's like, I have joke. I don't know why. I'm, I'm going to give him like a Schwarzenegger accent type thing. I have joke for you. Knock, knock. And everyone's just like, oh, God, <laughs> this guy's so why, funny. <laughs> uh, this is the worst part of Easter. This is the worst part of Easter. <laughs> I'm endure this joke. This it's joke, funny, it's yes. <laughs> no, it's not. Yeah, it's not yeah, funny yeah. <laughs> that's great. That's that, that's. I'm going to start my next Easter sermon with. I'm going to say, um, yeah, knock knock. That's going to be the knock the, knock. Yeah. Aren't you glad I didn't say? I don't even know. <laughs> that would be a good one for Easter. <laughs> Aren't you um, glad I didn't have another joke? <laughs> that's right. Aren't you glad I didn't? Um, you know, there is this thing. It reminds me of this idea of two seemingly opposing concepts needing each other for either one to exist. And mm -hmm. and um, and I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this. You know, I, I, 
I think we've talked about this before in a previous episode, but you know, there's this idea that I, I really think is true that um, it, in some very real ways that grief and love, you know, are two names for the same reality, right? There is a way to never to grieve in life and that's never to love, right? And, and that, and that grief is, is the experience of love when what you love isn't there anymore, but it's, it's the same, it's two names for the same emotion, the same reality. Um, I have mentioned before that I really like reading, um, Thich Nhat Hanh, who's a Buddhist author, um, who has a deep appreciation for Christianity. He, he died very recently as of the recording of this episode, you know, and, and he, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh talks about the same thing as suffering and joy that, that they're kind of two sides of the same coin and you can't really know one without the other. He, he went so far to say is he, he, he didn't want to live in a reality without suffering because he thought that kind of reality wouldn't have, couldn't have joy in it either. And I wonder kind of the same thing with resurrection and the cross too, that we, we can't know, we couldn't know resurrection without the, you know, the cross, you know, that they're kind of two sides of the same reality. They, they, they need each other to exist maybe. And, and I wonder if that's maybe what Moltmann was kind of getting at a little bit as well. Um, what do you think? Um, yeah, maybe I'm just reading into it. I'd have to think some more about that. And yeah, I, I certainly grief and love are strangely intertwined in our reality here, and and they do spring from similar sources, but ultimately, I don't know. Yeah, love is wanting to be with someone or grow closer to them, and grief is loss. Mm -hmm. So sometimes they're known in one another, but I'm not sure if they're the two sides of the same coin. I'd have to mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Um, but, but he's on to something, certainly. And yes, in Jesus' resurrected form, he still has his scars. And the mm -hmm. resurrection would not make sense without the cross. And in some ways, the cross wouldn't make sense without the resurrection, because why would God do that? Should, I mean, that's kind of the, the, the question for the disciples is, right. he shouldn't go to Jerusalem. Why would you do that? Why would you risk... Uh, physically being near the authorities you've antagonized already. Right. Uh, so, yeah, I think you're right. He's almost onto a mature level of dealing with joy and sadness. And it makes me think of how sometimes it, after a funeral, people might be laughing. And you might think, why are these people laughing? This person died. It's a funeral or after a funeral. And the reason is they haven't been together in a long time. So they're family members that are reading quite, and they might be actually laughing at something funny that the deceased person used to do. And it's not a laughter that's mocking. It's a laughter that's kind of joyful because they're sharing a memory. So, yeah, so joy yeah. and sadness are strangely connected. I mean, what are you going to do when you're, you're laying in a hospital bed? You kind of would like someone to maybe tell you some jokes to break up. Right. Or to visit with yeah, you yeah. or maybe even laugh at you. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. It, it, it's, uh, they're not, they're <clears throat> not enemies. They're no, not allergic no. to one another. Yeah. No. I love that. What, what do you think? How would you phrase it? Yeah. yeah no, me, I, it's like a maturity of being able to live with both. And, yeah. And watching the wires cross sometimes. I love that. Such, that's so well said. It reminds me one of the, one of the, the weirdest and most beautiful and holiest moments I've had in a hospital was a um, long, long time ago. I, I um, worked as a hospital chaplain intern, just as for part of the, pro the church process of ordination. The chaplain's job in that particular hospital was you were with, uh, you were in the room whenever somebody died. And um, so saw a lot of people and their families at the moments of death. And But there was mm -hmm. this one family that I remember, it was a dad I forget his age. Let's say maybe about, I don't know, 70 or so, 60 or 70. His wife was there, probably the same age, 60 or 70. And, and the daughter was there, uh, being about 40, 30 or 40 or so. And they just had this great sense of humor. But of course, they were also, I mean, they were weeping. They were grieving, you know, just tears all over their face. He was passing away. And um, finally, the, I, and I should say finally, but but this moment came when, when the dad died, you know, and, and the, the heart monitor, you know, it just, it, it just you know, it flatlined and, it, you know, he he, there was this moment when he died, and and they were weeping and grieving and it was awful, um, but then also the daughter reached over and grabbed the chin of her of her dead father, 
and and moved his chin up and down with her hand and kind of like a puppet and and with her own voice made him say well i'm dead <laughs> and oh they just gosh. and they just <laughs> broke up laughing they just they were uh, they, they they thought it was so hilarious and i loved that moment it was weird it was bizarre but it was like holy and beautiful too and it was entirely appropriate in that moment for that family and i, I would never tell any other family to do that but that was right for that family and it was holy and it was grief and it was laughter all at that the same time funny and it was really neat it was really cool. I mean, that's like a monty python bit yeah yeah <laughs> You know? Oh my gosh! But you're right. You're right. I mean, there's something about we feel like oh oh we feel like we feel like we feel like the reality of death and suffering and the cross means that it's bad, right? For us to also mm-hmm. have laughter or joy, and it reminds me of what Moltmann says in this passage where he says we cannot we cannot play as long as we feel guilt. Right. Right. He he connects guilt to play, and he 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 says that. The guilty person cannot play. Mm-hmm. Right? This, as long as we feel like we have to bear the weight of this of this suffering and and heartache, and and in in such a way that I don't know that there's a guilt to it or a kind of that, that we can't find ourselves we can't give ourselves permission to play or experience joy. Maybe even at the same time. Um. I, there's a yeah, song I it, love it, called My Joy is Heavy. It talks about the he- the heavy kind of joy that comes in life. Mm-hmm. Anyway, you want to say something? Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. No, no. Uh, there's a, there's a, fa- it might be Nietzsche, the philosopher Nietzsche, but, but there's some line somewhere along he or someone else commented. It, it's, it's something, it's like, uh, it's weird how the redeemed don't look more like it. <laughs> Basically <laughs> ripping on Christians for being so dour and sour and, and racked with personal guilt or whatever, when the truth is if you've been redeemed, you think you would be set free yeah. and you would be joyful. And, and he was right in that comment that, that the point of Christianity is not to make you feel bad, it's to, to make you feel good. Where does that idea come from that we have to be dour and somber? I, maybe I think this kind of relates to what Moltmann's talking about. I think it does. I, I think it's partly social control, and and that's how mm. that's how parents and institutions and groups often try to exert control is making kids making kids and people feel guilty. Well, you know, mm. if you don't put in your 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 ten percent tithe, then you know you're a bad Christian, or you need to go to church every week. Neither of which is exactly in the Bible. Like, right, hopefully right. You want to go to church, or whatever your house of worship is, but uh, the guilt is institutions talking. Yeah, guilt is is uh, it gets a lot of work done for institutions. Yeah, so it's power. I think that's a powerful way to talk and people are naturally guilty you you i you see it with toddlers and others that when they get in trouble or corrected they immediately shame and guilt are kind of a basic part of our psyche yeah and so i think i guess to me if if you had lord of the flies and kids on an island they would naturally develop forms of guilt and shame Hmm. and then various groups can can amplify that and seek to control it you know um yeah, I don't. It's it's a great question, but it's something to struggle with, and 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 Christianity's message. Yes, we are sinful and we do have guilt, but but actually, you don't. <laughs> right, that's the big surprise. Is it actually it's been removed? Yeah, I I wonder if I mean I wonder if this relates to what Moltmann's talking about with the cross. You know, I mean, and mm-hmm. and that understanding of the cross that he that he kind of tries to <clears throat> gently poke at that we mentioned at the beginning of our discussion, you know, I mean, if, if, if our, if our fundamental understanding of Jesus is that, um, that we got Jesus killed because of what horrible people we are, that, that, that this one who reveals God and shows love uh, Christianity asserts, you know, more perfectly than any other one we've seen um, that this human being of such great love 
got killed because of how horrible we are, how could we not feel like the point of all of this is guilt? <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. I mean, it, it kind of sets us up for a lifetime of guilt and shame. It does. It does. Um, I guess that's an easier message. It fits on a little pamphlet or brochure. Or, yeah, yeah. Um, it, and, it's, and it's not that it's untrue, but it's not the whole truth. Yeah, and right? I wonder if it's true. I mean in different ways than what we think it's true. You know what I mean? Maybe yes, as well. That's probably um, fair. I don't know. I don't know. We need to figure out Christianity in uh, this hour <laughs> podcast We're talking about board. Games. <laughs> uh, but I love these things are so mysterious because they, they point to uh, think they point to their ultimate truths, which is that they're paradoxical. Yeah. 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 You know, if it was yeah. a neat little package, you're like, oh, this seems a bit convenient, but instead it's a big old hot mess. Right. So. right. Which I think you're right. Kind of speaks to the truth of all of this. If, if, if it were something we could easily figure out, it right. probably wouldn't be true. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I mean, when you mention the guilt too, it's, it's kind of odd as I think about like the New Testament there's not a lot of people moping around with guilt, right? Mm -hmm. Paul doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is a bit when Jesus says to Peter, feed my sheep, and it's clearly him kind of referencing Peter's betrayal. But, but it doesn't, it's, it's just a short passage. But there, there's not really a lot of people wallowing in guilt in the right, Bible. Right, right. Is that fair? I absolutely and I, I, that's a really good point. I'm trying to, make. to think of counter examples, and I can't. So I mean, that's, and, that's and sure, there, there are moments of guilt, but yeah, because guilt's part of the human experience, right? Right, and and it, an important <clears throat> part of the human experience. When we do something <clears throat> wrong, it's important to feel guilt, you know. But yeah, it, it has. But its you're place. right; it has its place. I, that's a great point because I, I think that's an excellent. That's really good, Kevin. Because I, because I, I, I think that says something fundamental about God too. I mean. What does it say about God if we think that God's highest dream for us is just to live 80 years of feeling guilty and then die? You know, I mean, what, what, I mean, what <laughs> right. kind of God is that? <laughs> right, That's, right. I mean, it's not a very loving, I mean, I don't, I don't think a loving God. we find that in the gospels? No. I mean, no, Jesus right, condemns right. hypocrisy and condemns people, but he doesn't encourage them to, to be guilty. Right, 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 right. Interesting. And, and then this brings up, I think, ooh, the, the, the last bell. part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which is something that a lot of Christians specifically, I think, feel guilt over um, or can feel guilt over, which we can get maybe to a little bit, questions of purpose, questions of purpose. And um, Moltmann says here um, in the last part of our of our reading today. Well, I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing in my own words, but uh, that the final purpose of history is the, is liberation from the tyranny of purpose, mm. liberation from the tyranny of needing to have a purpose. And here, here's a quote that I, I, I like um, from, from Moltmann. This is page 34. Moltmann says, life, which is made meaningful by purposes and goals must find the vision of heaven terrible since that vision only invites infinite and purposeless boredom. And in Christian eschatology, eschatology is kind of a fancy the theological word, meaning just kind of like the study of the end things, the study of the end times, the end of all things. Christian eschatology has never thought of the end of history as a kind of retirement or payday. Mm. But I love this idea that a life so which good. is built on the idea that purpose and goals are essential for us having meaning is a life which can't tolerate the idea of heaven because then it seems purposeless. Right. Right. I don't know. What do you, what do you, any thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, I have mixed thoughts, to be honest. I, yeah. I love the idea that we are more than our jobs or vocations or purpose. It's hard for me to think, though, that we could exist as humans without some sense of purpose. So if you think of utopia, 
I get that you don't have to have a purpose, but it seems like life would still be nice to have a purpose. Mm -hmm. We're, we're goal setting creatures, but maybe the difference is it's a goal you set, you know, you're going to run an ultra marathon in utopia type thing. Cause I, I think if we don't have purpose, then we're just kind of, it seems like it, most everything has a purpose. Like the squirrels exist to destroy things and the deer exist to be hit by cars <laughs> And my cat exists to ignore us. Um, so yeah, it's hard to it's hard to think of us without purpose. I'm not sure I like the purposelessness, but mm. I, or vocationlessness. But I'm not sure it's quite what he means, and maybe that's a translation issue. I think it's more of I think what he's getting at is we don't have to do things. We're not coerced. Whereas in this life, you are coerced because you've got to pay the bills, you've got to pay the mortgage, you've got to. You know, you've got to cut your fingernails and all that stuff. Is there a difference between meaning and purpose? Mm. I found myself asking and thinking through all this stuff. Purpose, I think of, and I'm not looking it up, and that I should, you know, we should be looking this up, but purpose, I think of as having a goal, a destination, and moving towards it. Meaning may not be related to purpose. Like I could see a pretty butterfly go by the window and think, oh, there's meaning. Mm -hmm. That's meaningful because of its beauty and, and the fact that I wasn't expecting it. It's an unexpected moment of beauty. Mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. to me would be random purposelessness, right? That mm -hmm. just happened to fly by as I looked. Now, in, side note, I've been doing some reading on astrology and stuff related to Dante because Dante has some judgments in astrology. So much of astrology and other things the idea is somehow everything is all connected. Mm. So the planet Mercury is connected to your birth if you were born under the sign of Mercury. You see it a little bit in the Bible because remember the Magi follow the star. Yeah. And yeah. that was astrology. So they, they the port somehow the what happens in the skies is connected to what happens on Earth. Hmm. So are they just random events or are they purposeful? Hmm. And I don't know. I, I don't tend to, I mean, I personally don't believe the planets have anything to do with anything. So besides just the fact of the galaxy, right? Right, right, right. So it'd very, be very, very different. I guess it's thinking about a world of omen. I, I'm totally off subject. I need to cut this out. <laughs> no, but just no, think no, about no, omens, no, you're good. Right? And things are I don't connected. Think it's, and like, oh, I, don't I think saw it's... a black crow today. That must mean something. You know, there's yeah, yeah, that yeah. kind of practice or beliefs or spirituality. And, and there are Christians that do this too. Yes, you know, They believe yes, yes. that there's signs from angels or whatever. But that's not purposeful either. Well, I guess it's, it's well, the but... world having purpose, but you don't because it's random. What, what? Go ahead. Go for mm. it. No, no, no. Wait, I, I want to let you finish. But no, you're I'm, saying I'm such totally good out things. of steam. I'm exhausted. I am in such a corner, Daniel. I have painted myself in a corner. I don't even know what's going on. I think I think in that corner, you have found a door and opened it up <laughs> to a new universe. Only because you pointed it out to me. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, no. I actually ran into it. I didn't even know. The doorknob <laughs> left me stick. Uh, no, no, no. I think it's great. No, it reminds me. Well, okay, yeah, just so many things. Um, oh, this is so, oh, you're so good. Um, so I, and I am just, I guess, just to name this claim, this, I, I'm just kind of seeing it through the lens of my own experience and journey. And so sure. I apologize if it seems kind of rather self-oriented. <clears throat> but uh, I feel like there is a part in the human experience and being human, at least in, the, in Western humanity, maybe it's different in different parts of the world, but in our corner of the world, at least it has been a part of my human experience to, to kind of want to see for each one to kind of want to see themselves as kind of like the chosen one, you know, like this, like the really special one, like the, and, and to see, which then gives us this lens of seeing reality around us as, Oh, Oh yeah. Yeah. This, that crow over there. Yeah. This is saying, something special about me because because i'm pretty i'm i'm pretty special right and or mm -hmm. you know and and mercury this is this is something about to, related to kind of my journey because yeah i'm i'm kind of pretty special and 
And and and and by the way, I subscribe to this whole thing. Everyone's special in their own way, but we're going to get around to that in a different way. I'm not, and I'm not trying to deny that. But um, but I, I I feel like this gets around to this idea of of purpose and purposelessness. The idea of seeking out our purpose and our goals. I mean, it's so hard, you know. In one way, in one way, it's like you said, it's it's necessary to get things done, right? It's necessary to, um, it is necessary to get things done. And um, to give us a sense of direction when we feel directionless. On the other hand, I, I know, I feel like I've also experienced, you know, kind of some hurt from that, you know, too, and kind of damage from that uh, in, in different kind of aspects. I remember when I was, you know, kind of around college, probably around the time that you and I first met each other, Kevin. Remember the, the golden days, the good old days back then when... It was 400 years ago. Full heads of hair and... We were terribly muscular and yes. we, were, we were both well over six feet tall at that time too. And <laughs> I think we met on the, on the we were football giants. Team. Yeah, we were. Everyone we were, else was grasshoppers. That's right. Um, but I felt this over, you know, I grew up in the church. I felt this overwhelming sense of obligation as somebody who's trying to follow Jesus to figure out to figure out my purpose in, in life, right? This, this, it was a capital P, you know, and just that, that I, it almost kind of this idea, you know, at the very beginning of time, God said that one day Daniel will be born and mm-hmm. Daniel's purpose will be, oh, I'm not going to say it. You got to figure it out, you know, and then, and then, <laughs> and, and if I didn't figure it out, I was letting God down, right? You know, and I right. was let, you know, and I was letting the universe uh-huh. down. There was all these, and and I, I think I got that from some parts of the church and some parts of a Christian theology. And that just that just it just drove me mad for for years and also just feelings of guilt, like I was letting God down and things like that. Um wow. and, and I I I also think that can kind of cause some hurt in the church. I was having this conversation the other day with a fellow pastor about just how when we're solely focused on the church and having, you know, kind of goals and um, it, it, I mean, there's a, there's a place for that, but it can also, it, it can also eliminate from our vocabulary joy, you know, and, mm-hmm. and, and belovedness and, and play. Um, so I think for me, and I'm rambling here and I'm sorry, I think for me, one thing that's been helpful, and I guess what I was asking about meaning earlier, is coming to see, coming to think about it more in terms of meaning, you know, and, and more like I'm, I'm, I'm put here on this earth to, for the same reason that everyone's put here on this earth, to figure out how, how best to love each other, you know, how, how best to love the people around me. Hmm. And, um, and so when I hear Jürgen Moltmann talking about the purposelessness of heaven, and how that's anticipated in play and in games. I don't know. I find that very liberating. Like, and and Mm. I I almost, it feels like something that I've been waiting for somebody to say that no one has said. Is it because purpose is, yeah, no. And that's, and that's, that's, that's awesome. And I want to, I guess I'm curious why we're having different, it's not totally different reactions, but I, I, I want to, nudge into that a little bit and yeah yeah and one thing i'd ask you is do you think it's because for you purpose is connected with doing versus being or is that too simple or is it that like you get to yeah yeah it's not about achievement and doing yep what the purpose think? is yep i think i almost kind of equate that with vocation and i, I and i wonder right. if a lot of people do and I mean, maybe calling. i'm wrong on that right but but I do think you know our our culture, that is a message our culture very much um, instills in us, right? That we are what we do in life, right? Right. I mean, it's a very basic question to ask at a cocktail party, et cetera. You know, what do you do? Yeah. yeah. And then we had to create this weird category of homemaker for women mm-hmm. who were not working outside the home because because mm-hmm. we the category and and. We're, it's trying to be polite, but it was awkward because it, that doesn't fit 
the fact that you're not working makes a weird exception because everyone acknowledges that being a homemaker and working in the home is valid and important. It's things have to get done and all that, but it, it's not real work because you're not getting paid, right? So you can see how the categories start falling apart. Because people can't money. simply be people. They have to have a job. Right, right, right. <clears throat> to your point. Right. And, uh, yeah, so did you work outside the home type thing? Um, yeah, and I, I can identify with that feeling like you're sp- there's, there's some secret thing you're supposed to be doing and you'll never be happy till you find it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But somehow it's on you to figure it out, and if you don't, it's gonna be really bad. Yeah, you're gonna ruin your identify. life if you don't figure it out. Yeah, right. Yeah, God's just sitting there agonizing, waiting for you to figure it out. Right, but right. but you're right. not gonna be told. Yeah, that that is a bit taking yourself too seriously, isn't it? Whereas if our purpose is just to to have an identity, figure out ways to love each other as we go through life. Yeah. That's something that's much more manageable. No, I shouldn't say manageable, but understandable. It's still hard. It's really hard. Maybe the hardest thing of right. all. But um, it's, under, it's, it's easier to understand and to comprehend. We don't have to go on a lifelong quest to figure that out. Right. Um, but to me, the purposelessness is kind of like day three of a vacation. If you don't have a lot of plans, you're like, well... It was cool to have a few days of nothing to do, but now I need, like, a, I kind of need a project of some sort. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, we, yeah. we spent six weeks in Hawaii a long time ago, and it sounds really cool, but it got kind of weird because wow. when you're somewhere long, a long term, time. you can't, yeah, you can't just do expensive, exciting things every day. Right. So you end right. up just going to the mall, and I kind of wanted something to do. Because mm. hanging out sounds fun, but after, you know, I don't know. Because you're, you're not really living there and you don't have a job or a purpose, but you're neither on vacation because that would just be one week and you see these highlights. Instead, you're there kind of long-term, short-term. And maybe some people can do that, but... Would you say that, that, that there is... what That reality within us is the desire to overcome unnecessary obstacles? <sighs> <laughs> that's good one yes i need some goals you're absolutely which, right and play gives you goals even yeah. temporary goals at least for, the, for those of us to crush daniel and watch him weep my goal is to be crushed by kevin taylor <laughs> and to know that my tears bring him uh, joy. no for for listeners maybe who didn't hear it before we have um a previous book we talked about is bernard Suits the grasshopper and his definition of play and games is the overcoming of unnecessary obstacles and and that's a pretty agreed upon yeah yeah definition of a game yeah 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 i i did i needed some unnecessary obstacles i needed some goals um so not just random things which is can i take this rock and skip it along a pond i mean that's fine for a little bit but something right. a little more interesting but yeah i, I needed <laughs> I don't want to be purpose. I still want purpose and I want goals and aims, but I don't necessarily want to have to work or to feel like I have to do something. So maybe yeah. that's the difference. It's and I think what I, what I hear you saying is for you, those overcoming of obstacles, whether they're necessary or not. And Bernard Suits, I guess, argues none of them ultimately are necessary, but that is overcoming of obstacles is, is purpose. That's what, is that what I hear you saying? That that's kind yeah. of... That's what yeah. I hear you saying. Yeah. Yeah, I think maybe that, that I can see that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go climb this mountain. So what do I need to do? And what, how do I prepare? And do I have the right stuff? And can I do it? So I, that that's... Humans are inherently goal-setting, I think. Yeah. Well, that, I guess Bernard Suits has said, right, and, and a lot of the game philosophers we've talked about, that is, it is, it is inherent to our our wiring and our hearts and our minds that we find joy in uh, overcoming obstacles, overcoming mm-hmm. unnecessary obstacles, I guess suits would say. And, right. Um, and, you know, thinking of Dante, the whole idea of, of heaven is sort of this ascent. You're going up, like you're, you're, you're growing and you're moving 
and the inferno hell they end up going in circles so it's this meaninglessness but they have to keep moving except mm. at the very and of course this is all dante's imagination um but he imagines the bottom of hell is ice and satan is frozen in it mm. because that's the lack of motion and communication or growth right like that would be an ultimately purposeless life oh which that's would be fascinating frozen in ice yeah, because life wants to grow, um, as Simone Weil said. Like all the the only thing Simone Weil said, the only thing that defies gravity naturally is light, which is so cool. Like the plants, mm. the trees, they defy gravity, moving up to the light. And so, and who is so, who is Simone Weil? She is a French twentieth century French writer. Oh, neat, neat. She's wacky, but she's great. Oh. So yeah, yeah, I, th that's great. maybe that's where I'm trying to get it with that we still need purpose, which is to move towards the light, right? We need a goal mm. versus being almost like rocks and stones that just like, or oh, I'm going to lay here. That's not yeah. human. That's mineral life. Uh, Kevin, real quick, I, I realize we haven't we haven't talked about any games at all. Could I ask? Can I ask? And, and I'll mention one. Yeah, I'll do some one, editing on this. I'll one game that you've played recently. I mentioned this in the newsletter, but I've been going back to the West Kingdom trilogy, Garfield yeah. Games, because of Shem Phillips, and uh, that's really fun. It, it's games mm. that I used to play a lot, and I've been doing it solo. And so it's like a cool memory, but I do have to do a little bit of going back to the rules. I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember how this worked and that worked. So it's kind of fun seeing the neural pathways light up again. And, yeah, and the yeah. games look so good because of all the colors. Yeah, I was really yeah. pleased, and yeah. the criminals are like purple and the green, and the townsfolk, and yeah, it's awesome. How about you? It's a great series. I love that. Uh, we have uh, Kristen and I have been playing a lot recently of um, this really really small box game came out last year, Sea Salt and Paper. It's a, it's a very tiny. It's just a card, just a deck of cards, but we're mm. really enjoying it. Um, and. Um, I have yet to win it. Kristen wins every, every game, but it's Are it's you uh, but it's 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 great. Um, there's it has one of these cool kind of shoot the moon rules. It says there are four mermaid cards in the deck, and it says if you get f four mermaid cards, all four mermaid cards in your hand at one time, you instantly win the game. Like not not only just you win the round, but you win like the whole game because there are multiple rounds in the game. So that's always tempting, right, to try to get all four mermaid cards, but that's never happened and. Um, you can also, you have some control over when you end the game or mm. end the round. Um, mm. and, uh, you, you can, it's kind of like a push your luck sort of thing. Like you could, you can signal the end immediately after your turn, or you can signal the end after the other person uh, you get to give the person one more chance and then it ends. And, but you get, so you get some bonuses if you give the other person another chance, but you still win. But you get penalized if you give the other person another chance and you end up losing. Hmm. And so there's this kind of interesting push and pull about do I want to end the game now and or not? And I always choose wrongly on that. And Kristen schools me every time. But it's a it's a fun game. It does seem like some games people innately grasp, and other games are are uh, takes. That sounds like a game that for for you you're having to get your head around, and Kristen is able to grok immediately yeah so yeah. i've seen that and, and experienced that so i hear you yeah you're like yeah. Well, how do you why are you so good at this game and they're like i don't know i just get it it's like some people just start yeah. they take everyone can learn to swim but some people just take to it faster but i bet there are some games that you get immediately that others don't it might be it might be maybe so yeah for whatever reason it, it yeah. fits in your wheelhouse clubhouse in our stats, though, Kristen has a much higher winning rate across all games than I do. She's she is much better at, at games uh, than I am. Uh -huh. um, I heard a podcast once that was, or the name of a podcast, I think, or an account or something like that, where it was the creator was a husband who was married, and he 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 was um he, he was very much into, into board games, and he was married to a woman who was not quite as much into board games. And the name of the podcast was. Um, I teach her the rules. She beats me. And that was the name of the podcast. And, <laughs> and, and I feel like that's often the story for Kristen and me too. So, that is so funny. Um, yeah. Why aren't scientists studying this? I mean, they've got MRIs and also, <laughs> why are they not studying yeah. 
what me- what makes her brain get this yeah that's so funny yeah i think i saw on reddit somewhere some guy that was kind of saying i he was the board game collector he loved board games he rarely wins and i thought yeah that i kind of know what you're meaning i'm the one that enjoys collecting enjoys playing them would like to win it's not in the cards i guess so no haha good good what can you do well um yeah, Kevin, again, thank you so much, as always, for wonderful yeah. discussion. Th- thank you, listeners, for uh, for tuning in, uh, watching, or listening to us. Uh, we're really grateful. Um, something we haven't said before, but just kind of want to maybe to, to, to share. Uh, if you in, in, enjoy the podcast um, or um, um, enjoy watching the video, but especially here on the podcast, it, it would mean so much to us if you would like to to rate and review us. We appreciate that. And apparently leaving a comment actually triggers the algorithms to recommend our podcast to more people. So if you want to leave a comment too, um, uh, rate and review us and leave a podcast, we'd appreciate that. It makes it easier apparently for other people to find the Board Game Faith podcast as well. We'd appreciate that. So that's on um, Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or, yeah, or even Spotify. Or, yeah, yeah. Spotify, yeah. yeah. Any of those platforms, YouTube, uh, we're there as well. And... If you want to contribute a little to help cover our costs, we'd love that. We have a Patreon. Yep. And yep. Um, yeah, reach out and to it, us with any questions. Absolutely. If people want, and if you want to reach us, you can um, reach us by email, uh, info at boardgamefaith.com, info mm-hmm. at boardgamefaith.com, or boardgamefaith at gmail.com. Right. That's it. Daniel, why don't you, I propose that we just, uh, we just hang on and wait for people to give us a comment on their podcast player of choice. You ready to wait? Yeah, we're just gonna we're just, we're gonna, just gonna wait, wait here. Okay, we're just gonna wait. Ready. I'm just gonna. Can you? Are you gonna pull up the podcast um, things now to, to 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 see if the comments are rolling in? I can do that. Okay. Sure. Um, yeah, I think, I think we should we should fill the time <laughs> as we wait. By talking slowly. Um, by talking slowly. What we, you know, what one of us should become the voice of the book as the guest. Okay. Um, and um, help, thank you. Help! I'm trapped on this table. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Theology of play. I'm so sorry. Um, here, let me lift you up. <laughs> And now I'm going to set you over and we're going to keep waiting. Not there. I'm afraid of heights. <laughs> Let me put you on the floor. Oh no, I tripped over you. Oh no. <laughs> That's my bad back. <laughs> we're just going to I spied because they have spines. <laughs> oh, that's very good. I like that. You're, you're a master of puns. Is there a chiropractor for, for, for books? <laughs> Uh, okay. We'll be waiting. All right. We're still waiting. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye.